welcome to the tape library. Tonight I have two cases of real life paranormal events to share with you. I'm going to be putting out shorter episodes for a little while so that I can make sure that I am sharing with you the best ghost stories and unexplainable events that I can find, but also hopefully get more entries out more consistently. If you prefer the longer episodes, don't worry. I still plan to have some in the very near future. Also, apologies if you notice some background noise on this episode. It's a dark and very windy day here in the south of England. But that just seems like a perfect time to tell some ghost stories. Tonight's entry sees two individuals who have encounters with something they can't explain. And it feels almost like in both cases that whatever it is that's hiding in the darkness seems to be enjoying toying with them. Harmless pranks? Or something more sinister? Let me know what you think in the comments. Case 1 This isn't my first experience with the paranormal. In fact, the last encounter I had happened in the same place. Dustin's house. This time we were hanging out in his garage. It was myself, Dustin, and two of our closest friends, Brandon and Drew. The four of us were all gathered in Dustin's garage, simply hanging out and talking about all matter of high school problems. During the talk, Dustin had made his way to the opposite side of the garage, next to the garage door. The three of us hadn't noticed that this was strategic on Dustin's part. See, there was another light switch in the garage, right next to the garage door. Dustin had hatched a scheme to scare us by suddenly turning the lights out in the middle of our conversation. It was near midnight and we were already wound up. It was guaranteed to leave us in complete darkness. However, this didn't go his way. Or our way either, none of us knew what was going to happen that night. So Dustin turned out the lights. It startled us at first, but we quickly realised it was Dustin trying to scare us. We asked multiple times for him to turn the light back on. He responded with poorly acted confusion. He eventually turned them back on for us. The lights in his garage were very bright. We were blinded for a second and had to let our eyes adjust to the light. And that's when we saw it. For some strange reason, when the lights came back on, the three of us on the opposite side from Dustin were all facing the same way. We all faced the wall opposite the garage door. It was painted white, so it made this very noticeable to us. We saw a black handprint that was slightly faded just this lone handprint. Now that may seem like it's easily explainable, which it definitely could be. However, what happened next can't be. The three of us mumbled to each other for a second, all asking if we remembered seeing that handprint before the lights went out. We all agreed that we hadn't. Dustin asked what was going on, and we told him we saw a black handprint. He must have thought we were joking because he didn't take us seriously at all. He turned the lights out on us again. This time we reacted with a little more anger, telling him to turn the lights back on. He tried to joke around with us, but we weren't in a joking mood. He caught the hint and turned the lights back on. When our eyes adjusted to the light again, we saw them. Multiple black handprints all overlapping each other in a horizontal straight line, leading from one wall to the next. Every wall in the garage now had a line of overlapping black handprints. They were surrounding us. It looked as though something, or someone, had been running on all fours, horizontally around us, circling us. Dustin saw them as well, The feeling of terror and panic set in for all of us. We trampled over one another trying to escape the garage. Drew pushed his hands and his head into my back, 
ramming me through the door into the house. The three of us spilled onto Dustin's living room floor. We couldn't catch our breath and kept shouting nonsense to each other, trying to make sense of what had just happened. We all had a hard time calming down. We tried to convince ourselves that it didn't even happen and that we only thought we had seen the handprints. However, when we mustered the courage to check, we were greeted with the handprints still being there. The garage then became a restricted area for us when we all hung out. The only time we would go back in was to try and do our own investigating. We never cleaned the handprints off. I'm not sure if it was out of fear of anger in whatever had left them, or if it was a reminder that it did happen. Either way, it's still one of the craziest experiences I've ever had, and it will always stick with me. If you haven't already, I'd love it if you could do me a favour and click like on this video, if you're enjoying the stories. It helps me get these encounters out to more and more people. Oh, and of course, don't forget to subscribe. I'll be bringing you lots more creepy real-life stories and deep dives into famous paranormal events, and I'd love you to join our growing community of archivists at the Tape Library. Let's get into case two, where we are going to be spending a bit of time in the basement of a funeral home. At another point in time, I longed to own and operate a funeral home. If I had the money, I think I still would. To get a feel for what I wanted, I applied and eventually landed a job as a funeral attendant. I loved this job. The responsibilities of a funeral attendant vary. You could be working in a visitation or service, transferring the deceased to or from hospitals, chapels and churches. You might be the designated limo driver for family and friends, or the coach driver bringing a loved one to their final resting place. What I enjoyed and got pride in doing most, and what brought me to you today, was managing cremations. I have many stories derived from my time at the funeral home, but only one made me reconsider the possibility of life after death. This is a true story. She was only 17 when she took her life after a breakup with her boyfriend. I was assigned to her visitation, drove the limo for her family, and would eventually handle her cremation. Her family was incredibly nice, and I think of their daughter every time I have a Diet Pepsi, her favourite drink. It was the night of her visitation. The coffee was hot, the cookies were fresh, but most importantly, the Diet Pepsi was cold. The family would begin to arrive around seven that night, filling the entrance and common area with small soft talk and sniffles. You do your best to welcome and make everyone feel comfortable, let them settle in for a bit before doing what I always found most difficult. Remind them why a certain set of doors weren't open and why it's important to only open them when they were ready. I will never forget the screams of her mother seeing her for the first time, or how worried I was that her hair would fall out of place and make visible the scars and bruising that makeup could only do so much to conceal. Her aunt had come by prior to the visitation to bring a scarf. As she cried, she asked I only use this if absolutely necessary. She said, my niece hung herself with a scarf. His words still haunt me. When it comes to cremation, the last thing you want to do is misidentify a body. So once the deceased arrived at the crematory, a unique number is assigned. These numbers are etched onto metal medallion to a hole and attached to steel wire about 10 inches long. Hard to miss in a collection of ash and bone when armed with a heavy duty magnet. The chapel I worked at had three levels. The crematory, of course, was in the basement, and I was working alone. I remember prepping for her cremation, and getting the documents aligned, 
and ensuring her assigned tag was her. It can take one to four hours to cremate an individual, no longer hindered by whether or not they were cremated in a casket. She was not. Following the cremation, her remains were called and then relocated to an enclosed yet small platform to ensure all metal objects were removed before processing. It only took about 20 seconds before the panic sunk in. I couldn't find it. Her tag was missing. I lifted every bone by hand and gingerly sifted through her remains. I re-swept the chamber and looked high and low in the area, to no avail. There was nothing left to do but bite the bullets and call management. Losing one of these tags is a huge disservice to the process of something so sensitive, and I felt sick. I went for my cell phone which was on the table beside her remains. It caught my eye sharply. Lying flat on top of her remains was the 10 inch tag. Not an overlap of bone or ash, nothing. It looked as though it was simply and carefully placed there. To this day I think this young girl was toying with me, perhaps having a bit of fun before our connected time came to a close. Either way it was eerie and something I can never explain. That's all for tonight. If you want some more terrifying real life ghost stories, this video has some of my favourite encounters I've been sent so far. Until next time, sweet dreams. <laughs>